students and welcome back to another lecture at yup master we are conducting the zoology sessions if you remember right now we are starting the structural organization in animals and until now we have started with connective tissue if you remember we have classified connective tissue based on the matrix remember that so we had how many different types of matrix either it could be a loose connective tissue where the matrix was a semi semi fluid or semi solid type of substance then we had a dense connective tissue all right where there was compactly arranged fibers and then we are going to be looking further deeper into today the specialized connective tissue in loose connective tissue if you remember children there were two different types of them one was areolar and the second being adipose in dense we had depending on how the fibers were arranged we had a dense regular and then we had a dense irregular type all right then if you remember in specialized connective tissue the matrix were of different types either they could have a mineralized matrix where we had skeletals like cartilage and bones or it could be a fluid connective tissue where the matrix was fluid and the example for that would be blood all right so in the last lecture we finished discussing about the cartilage and we had also given a brief introduction to bone so let us continue with bone today and we can also begin with blood all right <clears throat> so we start with bone if you remember a little recap that we did in the previous lecture first i asked you whether bone is a living or a dead tissue do you remember ahead we saw that bones have their own blood supply so i told you that if it has a blood supply then naturally it's going to be a living tissue all right <clears throat> we also saw that the different parts of the bones where the upper parts okay the expanded ends of the bones were known as epiphysis whereas the whole shaft of the bone is called as the diaphysis all right so we have the ends epiphysis and the shaft as diaphysis now bone is the hardest tissue of our body all right remember the hardest substance in our body is actually enamel on your teeth the outermost layer but after enamel it would be bone all right now bone uh, just like cartilage even bone had an outer covering to it okay since that covering was all around the bone now for all around we know the word which is used is peri P E R I peri means all around, and since it is all around the bone, it is going to be called as peri ostium. Ostium is a word which is confined only to bone. The same way how we had seen that the word chondro was there for cartilage. Similarly, the word osteo is going to be there for bone. So the covering on the bone it's made up of white collagen fibers, and you can see over here. that this is how the covering is so through this covering any of the blood vessels which want to supply the bone are going to are going to penetrate through this periosteum and they will be able to enter into the bone all right so that periosteum is a fibrous a white fibrous layer okay it's a white fibrous layer and it is the layer through which all the blood vessels the nerves everything can pass through and enter into the bone remember not only blood vessels because it requires nourishment and oxygen but even nerves are present and because of the presence of nerves this is why you get pain or you experience pain whenever you fracture your bones all right ahead we saw i told you that we know actually since school that bone is made up of calcium now al along with calcium there are other things too so the major mineral salt which is present in bone due to which the bone matrix becomes so hard and how is it so strong is because of the mineral salt which is called as hydroxyapatite so hydroxyapatite basically children if you see it is calcium only but along with calcium there are phosphates so po4 and there is oh also all right so hydroxyapatite it is the mineral salt then why why are we using the word osteo and osteo along with bone because that matrix which is present in bone is called as osseen okay so the matrix is osseen due to which or due to the deposition of that salt it's becoming very hard matrix all right then we had also started this that in bone the basic units or the structural units that we are finding for bone it's going to be called as an osteon or you may know you may call it also as a haversian system okay so haversian system is the name for a basic unit that is present in the bone over here whatever you are seeing 
this long substance that you are seeing here, this unit over here that you are seeing, this is what I call as a haversion system. Okay, now what am I going to see? Can you see that in this haversion system, in this complete haversion system, remember, however much the length of the bone would be, that is how long this haversion system will be. And can you see that in this haversion system, in the center of it, there is a canal. So the whole thing is a haversion system. Inside is going to be called as a haversion canal. Now in that canal, can you see the red and blue lines? What are those indicating? Those are indicating the blood vessels. So now what I will do is just considering this upper top layer, only considering that top layer, we will draw only that haversion system top layer, which will look something like this. So you can see over here, only I'm talking about this one here. Then these all are the top layers of the adjacent haversion systems. All right. So right now I only want to concentrate on this. This whole thing is known as a haversion system. All right. Then we see in the center is a haversion canal. So this canal is what is made up of blood vessels and nerves. So remember blood vessels and nerves. So in this canal, can I draw? First, I will be drawing an artery. Then I can be drawing a blue colored vein and then I will draw here a yellow colored nerve. So these are the three substances which are present in that haversion canal, blood vessels and nerves. Okay, so we're done with the canal. What about outside the canal? Outside the canal, this whole space is going to be called as, called as its matrix. All right, so let's start labeling this together. First of all, inside this whole part, is known as the haversion canal that is the haversion canal then after that outside this whole matrix region is known is the the matrix region can you see that that matrix is found in circles can you see that they are in concentric circles one upon the other one upon the other so these are concentric circles and when this matrix is found in these concentric circles i am going to call that matrix as lamellae Okay, so that matrix that is present in concentric circles, I'm going to call it as lamellae. All right, next step, just similar to cartilage, even the bones, the structure of the bone, the matrix of the bone has empty spaces. Now, the matrix of the bone, because it has these empty spaces here, okay, these empty spaces are present. Remember in cartilage also, we had empty spaces. Those empty spaces are what we call as lacunae. Because they are small spaces, empty spaces, they are called as lacunae. Remember that? It was there in cartilage also. Do you remember in cartilage, the lacunae, what was inside the lacunae? Cartilage cells. What did we call cartilage cells as? We named them as chondrocyte. So now if I'm referring to bone cells, may I call them as osteocytes? So similarly, just as how in cartilage we have the lacunae, in bone also lacunae is present and the lacunae contains bone cells which we will be calling as osteocytes. Alright, so now we have a haversion system. Inside the haversion system we have a haversion canal. The canal consists of blood vessels and nerves. Okay, outside the canal there is matrix. The matrix is found in concentric circles. These, this arranged matrix is known as lamellae. Inside the lamellae, we have empty spaces and those spaces are called as lacunae. Now, what is present inside the lacunae? They are the bone cells and the bone mature cells are going to be called as osteocytes. All right. Now, the question is, the cells are outside here, but the blood vessels are inside the canal, which means that we know that it is the artery which is going to be containing or carrying the nutrition artery is going to be carrying the oxygen artery is carrying even the calcium that will be coming from the food that you ate so now how will these nutrients and this oxygen how is it going to reach the osteocyte so you need a passageway don't you you need a canal you need passageways so there are passageways all of these black colored small fiber like substances that you are seeing all of those are passageways what are they doing these passageways, if you can see, they are connecting the central haversion canal with the osteocytes. 
okay so first they are connecting the central canal with the osteocytes second they are also connecting one osteocyte with an with another osteocyte connecting one osteocyte with another osteocyte so we see that these what you are seeing these small black fibrous like substances they are passageways they connect the haversian canal with the osteocyte they also connect one osteocyte with another osteocyte so not only connecting it from center to the cell but even from one cell to another cell all right so these passageways that we are seeing over here they are going to be given the name canaliculi canaliculi are passageways all right what do they join they join the haversian canal with the cell and they also join one osteocyte with another osteocyte okay all right so here we have connect we have completed all the different names that we've come across in bone let's go through it one more time because these names are new they might be seeming a little tough okay but as as you keep on hearing these words one after the other one upon the other the the more you're going to hear it the more familiar they sound and the more familiar it sounds the easier it will get okay so first we start this is the haversian system the system contains a central canal we'll call it as a haversian canal that canal consists of blood vessels and nerves outside to the canal there are there is a matrix the matrix is found in circles okay those circles matrix is called as the lamellae lamellae contains the empty spaces which are known as lacunae inside the lacunae we have bone cells bone cells are called as osteocytes all right osteocytes are connected to the central canal and to each other with the help of passageways the passageways were called as canaliculi all right so let's see all the different words that we have learned first matrix is made up of haversian systems okay then we see that the matrix is arranged in rings okay and that rings are called as the lamellae then we see that there are lacunae present and the lacunae contain osteocytes in them the bone cells then to connect the haversian canal with the cell we have canaliculi okay also we have that in the center there is a central canal also known as a haversian canal which contains the blood vessels and the nerves also okay nerves as well and don't forget the most important point that over here we see that one haversian system is vertically placed right so it goes from top to bottom but then the arterial blood that is coming in that needs to spread throughout the bone so let's see this diagram which we had seen a little while back can you see here this is a haversian system right this is the whole system being seen i want you to pay attention to another one i'd like you to pay attention to this part over here are you able to see that yellow part okay i'll make it blue okay so let's see over here i'd like you to focus on this part this is a haversian system can you see here also this is a haversian system which has been sliced another haversian system next to it it has been sliced so what you are able to see here can you see you can see the blood vessels there so because you are able to see this blood vessel here this is the artery near the artery we have the vein also okay so here can you see how the artery and the vein of one haversian system is connected can you see this connection over here this connection is present and that connection will be connecting one haversian system with another haversian system can you see that so these what you are seeing this canals that you are seeing which are the the horizontal canals which you are seeing which are connecting one haversian system with another haversian system is what we are going to be call calling as volkmann's canal what are they called as they are called as volkmann canals all right they call as volkmann's canals okay so the longitudinal canals are called as the haversian canals the transverse canals are called as the volkmann's canals all right so we just completed all the points of bone all right what were the different names that we had been through let's come to those names okay let's just revise those names i'll come to a blank screen and let's begin the first thing we started with basic unit of the bone all right let's start with that 
the first word that we had learned because this has many new words to it the basic unit of bone what did we call it as we call that as haversian system remember that okay so that is what we call as haversian system all right second point we see inside that basic unit there is a central canal okay canal with blood vessels that is going to be called as the haversian or you may call it as the central canal okay then we had the matrix outside so matrix in remember which rings they were called as concentric rings so matrix in concentric rings what was that matrix called as do you all remember that it was called as lamella okay then next we had the fourth point what was what was the fourth point do you remember that after the matrix in rings there were empty spaces do you remember the names of those spaces please write it down if you remember the names of the spaces in the chat box let's start that now okay so we had lacunae what was that empty empty spaces do you remember the name of the spell the spaces they were called as lacunae all right inside the lacunae we had bone cells does anyone remember what did we call as the bone cells the bone cells since they are cells can i call them as site okay site for cells and since they are bone cells can i call them as osteocyte osteocyte were the bone cells what else what other new name did we learn didn't we learn about the transverse canals or rather we learned first about the passageways so what were those passageways called as the passageways passageways does anyone remember what the passageways were called as children write that down in the chat box if you remember it passageways were known as canaliculi they were called as canaliculi okay after canaliculi let's come to the last part joining two haversian systems what were they called as they were known as let's see here the joining joining two haversian canals this is what we called as volkmann's canal all right so if you understood please give a thumbs up if you have understood okay now after this after bone let's see the other structures too okay now let's see a little bit more about bone we see that there are two different types of bones can you see over here this looks like a big cheese block doesn't it well if you see over here it's not cheese it's your bone and your bone actually does look like this kids okay so we see here that there is this part of the bone here which has all these holes and all these pores you see but then there is another part of the bone over here which has no pores at all all right so because of the presence of those pores can i call it as a spongy like appearance so that part of the bone will look like a sponge and i will call it as spongy bone but then the part of the bone which has no pores in it it's so dense and it's so compactly placed that i will call that as a compact bone so basically we have two types of bones one is the spongy bone the second being the compact bone all right now let's see the difference between the two in the center over here on top here i've got the spongy bone can you see here that the spongy bone has those pores but now i'd like to come and i'd like to introduce a new word to you these pores are created we know that okay so over here let me just draw this let's say if this is a pore over here there is another pore over here all these are pores over here okay but then look at the other aspect too not only do you see the pore you also see that these are the branched like things which are there this is actually part of the bone so these canal like substances that you are seeing 
these are called as trabeculae. What are they called as? These are called as trabeculae. So these trabeculae have spaces or have pores inside them which gives the whole thing a spongy like appearance. So remember this word it was called as trabeculae. Okay. Trabeculae are the ones which have pores. All right. Then look at the compact bone. There are no pores at all. So that's why we're calling it as compact bone. And naturally, wherever there is going to be pores, do you actually think there will be haversian systems there? Absolutely not. That's why the, the spongy bone here have no haversian systems. All the haversian systems are present at the, in the level of the compact bone. Alright, so let's see the difference between the two. First we have on one side spongy bone, second side compact bone. Alright, in the spongy bone, the matrix or remember we call the matrix as osine. Yes, osine had that salt. Do you remember the salt? It was called as hydroxyapatite. So here, the matrix or osine, it contains the columns. Remember the columns with the spaces? Those columns were called as trabeculae. Remember that word, okay? Those columns were called as trabeculae. Here they are. They were called as trabeculae. After that, in the compact mode, the matrix is also hard, but it is solid. It does not contain any spaces. Coming back to spongy bone, it is going to be filled with bone marrow. Now, what is bone marrow? If you've ever eaten bone or if you've ever eaten a non-vegetarian dish, and when you break open the bone, you can see that some brown colored powdery substance comes out. That powdery substance is none other than bone or uh, bone marrow. So over here, we see that bone marrow is of two types. Okay, the first type is red, the second one being yellow. Now, why are they different? Because they do different functions, okay? What is the function of red bone marrow? Red bone marrow is the place where all your blood cells are going to originate. Yes, I'm talking about blood cells. Which are the blood cells? They are our RBCs, our WBCs and our platelets. So these, all of these blood cells are arising from the red bone marrow. So we see here that the spongy bone, okay, the spongy bone is filled with which bone marrow? With red bone marrow. And what is its function? It is going to give rise to all the blood cells. So we see here, that's why we say that the function of it is hemopoiesis, okay. When I say hemopoiesis, heme means blood and poiesis stands for formation. Okay, poiesis stands for formation. So, hemopoiesis stands for blood formation. Okay, when we come back to compact bone, it is filled with yellow bone marrow. Okay, and that yellow bone marrow is going to be used for storing or storage of fat. Alright, so the two different types of bone marrows, which were they? Red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow was used for hemopoiesis. Yellow bone marrow was used for storage of fat. Alright. Next, when we come to spongy bone, there are absolutely no haversian systems due to all those sponges and those pores present there. Whereas, when we come to compact bone, haversian systems are present. Alright, now we want to see where are they located. The spongy bone is generally found in the expanded ends. Do you remember when we talk about bone, the expanded ends, the upper and the lower ends were what we call as epiphysis. Whereas when we come to the compact bone, it is present in the shaft region. What's the shaft region? The diaphysis was called as the shaft region. All right. So we see here in the shaft, it is called as diaphysis. Okay. In the expanded ends, it is at the epiphysis. All right. So here is the difference between a spongy bone and a compact bone. What you can do is you can take a screenshot of this. Please don't forget that word trabeculae. Take a screenshot of spongy and compact bone differentiation. Let's come now to a very interesting topic. You might be knowing most of these functions. If I ask you right now, what are the functions of bones? Can some of you enlist it in the chat box over there? Functions of bones. Doesn't bone provide support? Imagine if I tell you right now, let me remove all the bones from your body. Would you even be able to stand like if you're five foot tall or six foot tall? Would you stand like that? All of that is coming because of your bones. So, first of all, provides support. It also gives you shape and structure. 
it also helps in movement and locomotion along with providing protection for you an endoskeleton doesn't it it also helps in attachment of muscles do you remember we did muscle to bone wasn't that called as a tendon so the bone is present hence the muscles can be attached on it then remember we did red bone marrow and another one yellow bone marrow what were the functions of red bone marrow wasn't it storage of the or rather formation of the blood cells and formation of blood cells was called as hemopoiesis then we had storage of fat which bone marrow yellow bone marrow okay then we had storage of calcium also that's the main function of bone isn't it it stores calcium so children we now have concluded with all the different functions of bones okay we also did the different um, parts and the different structures which are there found in bone okay now i'd like to come to certain interesting topic which might be coming as mcqs let's just see that okay if at all i have a bone and if i dip it in hcl for a long time what happens is it is dipping a bone in hcl will be removing the calcium part from it okay so the calcium part is removed and the organic matter part remains behind but that same bone if instead of in hcl if i dip it in koh solution then what happens is it is going to remove opposite it will be removing all the organic matter like proteins and what is left behind is calcium and you all must be knowing this third one if i burn a bone okay in fire what happens to it it becomes ashes and what is left inorganic constituents okay like uh, calcium like phosphate what will it not contain it will not contain things like carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen sulfur all these things would not be there so please uh, take a note of these three bone in hcl bone in koh and bone in fire this could be important for your mcqs all right so children we completed now with the connective tissue in the specialized type we have completed the cartilage we have also completed about bone do you remember the name of the bone cells they were called as osteocytes now i'd like to come to a small topic before we actually sum it up and we actually wind up that bone and cartilage one topic is that whether it is a bone or whether it is a cartilage there are three different types of cells seen over there okay which are those cells let's see first when i'm talking about bone or whether i'm talking about cartilage you all know by now that there are specific words used okay if i want to talk about cartilage if i want to talk about cartilage okay i will be using the word chondro chondro right and if i want to talk about bone then while talking about bone i will be using the word osteo okay so chondro for cartilage osteo for bone now in chondro or rather in cartilage there could be three types of cells which are they there could be cells which allow breakage of of cartilage for breaking we use the word clast okay then we have cells which are immature can i use the word blast and then we have cells which are mature can i use the word site okay so you have chondroclast chondroblast chondrocyte okay then coming next to osteo similarly bone breaking cells why do we need bone breaking cells well let us say we know that in the bone all the calcium is stored right but what if what if in your blood calcium levels go low where do we get it from we have to go to the bones and the calcium stored in the bones how will it come out we need small cells which would break the bone cells in order to release the calcium so not for actually breaking the whole bone but just small parts of the bones so in order to be releasing calcium all right so in order to break even a small minute part of the bone we have cells again for breaking class immature blasts and mature sites 
all right so we see here that whether it is cartilage or whether it is bone we have three different types of cells let's just label over here what are the three uh, important functions of them this one is breaking break all right i'll call this as immature either immature or you may say growing and this one as mature same goes for bone. If you'd like to kindly take a screenshot of this before we go ahead. Alright, so these are the different types of bones or different types of cells present. So now we, uh, we can completely wind up with what we have connect. We have studied about the skeletal type that is cartilage and bone. Now ahead when we talk about the specialized connective tissue, we also have the fluid type of matrix and that fluid type of matrix would be none other than blood all right so when we talk about blood blood is fluid correct what are the different parts of blood and how would we find out about the different parts of blood well blood has a solid part and blood has a liquid part as well okay now we know that the blood has a solid part which are none other than the cells and the liquid part which are none other which is none other than the plasma but now we see that blood being fluid okay because it is fluid there naturally has to be more of the liquid part if there are more solids it wouldn't be a fluid medium but because it is fluid the liquid part will be more and that liquid part of blood is called as plasma the solid part will be less and how much less it is 45% of blood. So liquid part is 55%, solid part is 45%. Okay, how did we get this? Let us say I have a test tube filled with blood and what am I going to do with this test tube? I will centrifuge it. When I centrifuge this test tube, what I see is it is going to separate into its two components. The component which is heavier will naturally have a tendency to settle towards the bottom whereas the component which is lighter, the fluid will be floating on the top. So we see over here that below you have all the blood cells okay, and above you have the plasma part, 55% part. okay. Now if at all you see over here in these blood cells part, there is this part over here which are the RBCs. Then the small part region that you see here, this is the part which is containing the WBCs and the platelets. So can you see the difference in the amount of the cells? Okay, now if I only want to calculate how much RBCs are present in blood, then I'm going to be calling that as a hematocrit value. What is hematocrit? Hematocrit value means it is the percentage of RBCs which are found in blood. All right. And let's see ahead here the RBCs, then these are the WBCs and the platelets. Now, I told you that the liquid part of blood is called as plasma, right? So before we move on to the cells, let us just give us a brief look on what plasma is all about. Plasma being a fluid, it is going to be made up of a major content of water. There is not only water, but there are certain solutes to it too. Okay, the solid materials. Water makes a major part that is around 90 to 92 percent of plasma is water only and the remaining 8 to 10 percent are the solids. Okay, now when we talk about only plasma, okay, plasma is made up of remember 90 to 92 percent water. Now I want to focus on what were those 8 to 10 percent of solids. In those 8 to 10 percent solids, there were proteins too. So here if I have this whole part, then this is only plasma. There are going to be large proteins in them. Which are those proteins? First comes serum albumin, serum globulin, third was heparin, fourth being fibrinogen and fifth being prothrombin. How are we going to remember this? Well children, we will remember it by half H A F P G. H A F P G. How do you remember this? H stands for heparin. A, remember here, heparin. H for heparin. A stands for albumin. Okay. F stands for, here it is, fibrinogen. Then P stands for prothrombin. And then G finally stands for globulin. All right. So we have this half PG, heparin, albumin, fibrinogen 
prothrombin and globulin what are these all these are all called as these are all proteins and because they are present in the plasma we call them as plasma proteins but children along with plasma proteins there are other substances present in the blood too or in the plasma too which are they let's see those all right so i'll remove these okay so now let's see what else is there we also are going to be having nutrients which are the different types of nutrients there are glucose amino acids fatty acids glycerol all of these substances are present too even nitrogenous wastes the nitrogenous waste if you remember these are the ones which are formed in the liver remember those which are those ammonia urea uric acid even creatinine formed from muscle well these are mostly formed in the liver and they have to be taken to the kidney who is the transport system from liver to kidney obviously there is no duct so all of these substances have to travel by blood okay so naturally which which part of blood are they traveling in in the plasma so nitrogen is waste also traveling through plasma gases which are present you know that oxygen has to reach each and every part of the body okay that is being done by the rbcs but then other gases are also dissolved in the plasma that oxygen which is there even the carbon dioxide which is being transported a majority part of it will be in the rbc understood the oxygen but then a certain amount of oxygen will be delivered by the plasma too so even the plasma would have all these gases in it like oxygen carbon dioxide nitrogen and all then there are regulatory substances like enzymes and hormones even the hormones which are traveling they are going to be traveling with the help of the plasma okay then we have inorganic substances too for example bicarbonates chlorides phosphates sulfates like sodium potassium calcium magnesium all of these all these inorganic substances also are traveling by plasma so these are all the substances present along with those proteins do you remember those proteins if you remember it write them down the proteins remember that uh, what were the letters we were remembering them as half h a f half p g what were they standing as heparin albumin fibrinogen prothrombin and globulin what are these these are none other than plasma proteins these are the plasma proteins okay so that winds up the constituents which are present in plasma one more small topic i'd like to come to if you remember i told you that on centrifuging the blood is divided into its liquid and solid components okay there were blood cells and then there was plasma blood cells below plasma above but we also see that if at all we have only plasma and we allow plasma to stand alone for a little while only take plasma allow it to stand alone for a little while what we see is naturally a clot is going to form remove all those cells remove the rbc remove the wbc remove the platelets remove it all and we have only plasma still children a clot is formed and that clot if you remove that clot you have the plasma the clot is formed remove the clot what is remaining the plasma minus the clot okay that is going to be called as serum now how did this clot form the clot is formed because there are certain clotting factors in our plasma okay clotting factors how many clotting factors are there well there are 13 clotting factors we don't remember all of them we're going to remember just the important ones okay so if you have plasma and allow it to set for a little while the clot will formed remove the clot what you have left with you is known as serum okay now the clotting factors which i would like you to remember would be clotting factor 1 2 and 4 the first one do you remember those half pg what was half pg these were the proteins from proteins look at this here fibrinogen here we go fibrinogen then prothrombin here we go prothrombin so these plasma proteins are also contributing to be one of the clotting factors and also i told you a little while back that calcium is not required only by bone but calcium is required also by blood so because it is required by blood 
this is the reason why because of an important factor factor 4 is calcium all right so blood requires calcium too so now we just learnt about what is serum please note this down plasma minus the clotting factors is what we know as serum all right serum now when we talk about those plasma proteins okay there are important ones which have important functions too remember albumin half pg don't forget half pg okay in half pg let's first talk about albumin albumin then we have globulin and then we have fibrinogen out of these three let's start with fibrinogen when i talk about fibrinogen okay remember this is ogen ogen always means it is inactive Origin always means that it is inactive okay now these fibrinogen or fibrinogen is the one which is going to be helping during clotting okay so this is a clotting factor we saw that and it helps in clotting coagulation also means clotting okay coagulation means clotting then how is it helping in clotting because the fibrinogen okay it is inactive but then when it becomes active, it will become fibrin and fibrin is insoluble. If it is insoluble, it will stand away or it will stand apart from blood and that's what makes our clot. Okay, so how is it, be, what is it forming? It is being formed in the form of threads. How are these threads forming? Look at here. Can you see those small threads being formed there? And they are forming like a network or like a mesh over here. And this mesh that is being formed is none other than the clot being formed. So can you see how it is going to enmesh those blood cells of yours? So here are those blood cells. Okay, not only blood cells, all everything present there is going to be enmeshed. Can you see these fibers here? This is those fibrin threads. Normally in your blood, fibrinogen is soluble. It's inactive. So these fibers are not formed. But when it becomes activated, it becomes insoluble. And because it becomes insoluble, you see it in the form of threads. And this is going to hold on to those blood cells so that they don't fall out and so that the clot is formed and it prevents excess blood loss. Okay, that is clot formation. The next one we see albumin. When we talk about uh, or rather before albumin, let's go on to globulin. Okay, globulin, what the main function is that it is going to be helping in the defense mechanism of our body all right so we see here when we centrifuge blood we knew that there was plasma part and then there was the cell part okay now when we see in that part here from the plasma we know that if you remove one blood clot what is remaining behind is called as serum remember that now in the serum region there are special proteins present okay those special proteins let's see what they are okay i'll take this out and make it clear okay so now these special proteins that we have here look at what function they're going to do these are going to be called as immunoglobulins okay why are they called as immunoglobulins because they're helping in your immune system what are they actually they are nothing but antibodies okay do you know what is an antibody antibody okay what is this word it's called as antibody okay what is antibody going to do antibody has to fight against an antigen antibody has to fight against an antigen who is antigen Antigen is the bad guy coming from outside. Who is antibody? Antibody is the good guy fighting from inside. So what exactly is this antibody made up of? They are nothing but these globulins. Okay. And globulin is hence called as immunoglobulin because it is helping in your immune system. Now coming next to the third type of protein, the chief or albumin that's called as the chief transporter protein. A little while back, we just discussed that the nitrogenous waste like urea is made in the liver okay now from the liver that urea has to come out and it has to go to the kidney remember that but what i see is can that urea go alone on its own it can't that urea needs to be or that urea needs someone to come and take it from that liver to the kidney to travel from the liver all the way up to the kidney 
so now there needs to be a protein present in blood which is ready to take urea and make it go all the way to the kidney that protein which is present is going to be mostly albumin okay so it is this albumin protein albumin albumin is the one which is behaving as a chief transporter protein okay so it allows in the transport of many substances because many substances require to be held and taken to another place because they can't go on their own all right so we see here that uh, out of all the plasma proteins it is albumin which is the maximum okay maximum in count all right now after plasma we move on towards the blood cells okay now you know that there are three types of blood cells which are those blood cells are in they first red blood cells second white blood cells and third are the platelets all right now we we discussed a little while back when we were doing functions of bone that bone contains two types of marrows one was the red bone marrow and second was the yellow bone marrow i want to focus right now on the red bone marrow so the three cells red blood cells white blood cells and platelets okay you know that all of the these three cells are going to be formed in the red bone marrow now so from this red bone marrow these cells will come they if i want to give the scientific name for them being a cell site site and site now the formation of these red for the word red we have eth erythro so erythro means red so red cells for white we have the word leuco so white blood cells and for platelets the function of platelet is to make a clot okay now if it has to make a clot for clot we have the word thrombus thrombus means clot so because these are clot forming cells i will give it the name thrombocytes okay so platelets can be called as thrombocytes all right now ahead we see when i want to talk about the formation okay for formation we use a word called as poiesis all right poiesis means formation creation generation poiesis whether it is for rbcs wbcs or platelets so now similarly if it's a formation of rbc i'll give it the name erythropoiesis similarly leukopoiesis similarly thrombopoiesis okay so these are the different types of formation of these blood cells okay also now let us start with the rbcs all right rbcs do you remember the sign the other name for it can i call it as an erythrocyte okay so these are the erythrocytes we want to talk about these erythrocytes let's write them let's write that down rbcs are also called as what were they called as these were called as erythro sites okay remember one thing rbcs in mammals especially these are non nucleated so if the nucleus was present it is going to disappear okay these are non nucleated in fact these are also called as e nucleated they are called as e nucleated but then you will ask me that ma'am if something is absent don't we write a over there then why are we writing e nucleated it is it's supposed to be a nucleated right but children when these rbcs are forming where are they forming where do rbcs form come on tell me where are rbcs forming they are forming in the red bone marrow right so now if they are forming in the red bone marrow at that time they did have a nucleus but then what happened as they come out of the rbcs or rather or as they come out of the bone marrow rather as they are maturing as the rbcs are maturing in the bone marrow as they are developing they are slowly losing the nucleus which means that the nucleus becomes smaller 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 eventually when that rbc is mature enough to come out of the bone and enter into the circulation the nucleus is gone so because at some point of time in life because the nucleus was present that's why we call it as e nucleated if nucleus was not present since the beginning from the formation also then i could validly call it as a a nucleated okay but because it was present i'm calling it as e nucleated now 
in mammals all the all the mammals have enucleated rbcs except in camels okay and not only camels my medical students please pay attention not only camel but even in camels then sloth okay and even lambda these are the animals which have the erythrocytes with nucleus so if we see the difference over here this is an erythrocyte which has no nucleus like how we have it and this is the erythrocyte which has a nucleus like how camels would have it okay okay now the formation of rbcs i told you it was given the name called as erythropoiesis now the difference is that erythropoiesis during fetal stage is different from that during adult stage so when i'm talking about fetus remember adults where is the rbc forming in adults is forming in the red bone marrow but where is the rbc forming in the fetus in fetal stage rbc is formed inside organs okay which organs two organs which are called as the liver and the spleen this is where rbcs are forming in the fetal stage but then after that after birth once the bones have developed at that time in the adulthood also rbcs begin to form in the red bone marrow we've learned about that so erythropoiesis what is erythropoiesis the formation remember poiesis means formation erythropoiesis is happening at different levels or at different places at different stages of life in fetus it is liver and spleen and in adults it is the red bone marrow all right what is the life span of an rbc life span of an rbc ranges around 120 days if an mcq comes don't get confused 4 months is 120 days only okay children fine now what happens to this rbc after 120 days what do you do with it where does it go abhi wo now it is an old rbc where do what do we do with it after 120 days they are taken to an organ which we call as the spleen didn't we just talk about spleen right now so the spleen is an organ which before birth was generating rbcs but then after birth is a place where rbcs are going to go and die so because rbcs are going and dying at the level of the spleen i call the spleen as the graveyard of rbcs can i call it as the graveyard of rbcs yes all right now you know that rbcs have a component inside them which is the carrier of oxygen and i call that component as the hemoglobin okay in the cytoplasm of the rbc hemoglobin is present what is the main function of hemoglobin it would be carrying oxygen and how many molecules of hemoglobin are present look at that count over there a huge count look at that 280 million molecules of hemoglobin are present in each rbc in each rbc 280 million molecules of hemoglobin okay so we see here when i say the word hemoglobin i'll divide it into two parts one being heme and the second one being globulin what is globulin globulin is going to be the protein component and what is heme going to have heme is the part which is going to be containing the iron all right so there are four heme molecules and then there are four chains of globulin why do i say chains because proteins okay proteins are always there present in the form of chains all right so four iron and four chains those four chains are having two chains which are alpha chains two chains which are which are beta chains so let's see how this is here are first our four heme molecules which are containing iron okay now let's come to our four globulin chains two chains are alpha chains two chains are beta chains so this over here children this is our whole hemoglobin molecule where there are four globulins four hemes two alphas and two betas okay so this is our hemoglobin molecule now what is the function of hemoglobin it is holding on to oxygen it is called as an oxygen carrier okay so now over here which part of that hemoglobin is going to be carrying the oxygen it is the heme part which is carrying oxygen so now i see that every heme molecule can carry one oxygen 
So if I have four heme molecules, then this molecule of heme can carry four oxygens. So here is one, two, three and four. So here this is one molecule of hemoglobin which has managed to carry four molecules of oxygen. So one molecule of hemoglobin can combine with four molecules of oxygen. Okay. So I hope you remember this and I hope you understood this too. Now talking about the count. Okay. Hemoglobin count. Many times you see people who look very pale, who look very yellowish in color. Okay. They're not bright. They're not reddish. They're not pinkish skin. What happens? Why is that paleness and that dullness coming? There could be a chance that in their body the hemoglobin levels are low. Okay, this is also called as anemia. Now, if the hemoglobin levels are low in them, then there must be some level of hemoglobin which is normal. And which is that? In males, normal hemoglobin level would be around 13 to 18 grams per deciliter. And in females, the normal level would be around 11.5 to 16.5 grams per deciliter. Okay. Now, <clears throat> ahead we come to what all, what, what exactly is the breakdown of hemoglobin. Okay. Now, if I am saying that RBCs are lasting for 120 days. Okay. And RBC lasts for how many days? For 120 days. What happens to that RBC after 120 days? Didn't I tell you it's taken to the spleen? Now, if the RBC is taken to the spleen and it dies in the spleen, then naturally it's going to be broken down. And if the RBC is broken down, then inside the RBC there is hemoglobin. Won't that be broken down too? So, let's see how that happens. Okay. So, when I see here, every day, if I am saying that every RBC can last for 120 days, it's not like after 120 days then all new RBCs will be formed. RBC formation takes place every day. And every day there must be some, R, some percent of that RBC which has been previously made which is in your circulation right now. Some percent of it has turned 120 days old. So that how much percent is it? 1%. Every day 1% of the RBCs in your body have turned 120 days old. So now what do we do? We need them to break down. Where? In the spleen. So 1% of RBCs are broken down every day. And their hemoglobin will be broken down too. Now when hemoglobin is broken down, remember the two components, heme and globulin. So what happens to them? Remember that. Let's see here. Heme was the part which contained iron. Globulin was the part which contained protein. Now remember, this is something which is breaking down. Generally, what does our body do? Anything that's dead, anything that's broken down should be thrown away. But... Because this contains things like iron and protein, would you actually want to throw it away? You wouldn't want to. So let's see what our body does with it. When I'm talking about heme part, in the globulin, let's start with the globulins first. Okay, <clears throat> the protein part globulin here, the chains are going to be detached. Remember 2 alpha, 2 beta. So those chains are going to be detached. Actually, at the end of the day, it is amino acid, it is protein. So the chains are detached and they are sent to the plasma for reusal. So it is as if we are actually taking that RBC, we are breaking it down and breaking down the hemoglobin also, taking that protein out of it and we are recycling it. We are reusing it. Okay. So we are saving proteins. Then what about the next part? Heme part. Heme is the part which contains iron. So here we see that it is sent to the liver. Then the iron is going to be removed and that iron we want to store it. We don't want to lose iron and because iron is stored in the liver, okay, because that iron is stored in the liver, that liver appears very red in color and which is why we say that liver is a dark red or dark maroon colored organ because it stores all this iron. So it stores iron and in the form of fer uh, ferritin, it is storing iron in the form of ferritin. So here it goes. Iron is stored in the liver in the form of ferritin. Okay. Now, after globulin chains are sent to the plasma, recycled. After heme, the iron part is stored in the liver. Whatever now is left behind, whatever now is after degeneration, whatever then is left over, that remaining part of the hemoglobin is going to be broken down to form two pigments. 
Now these, if I'm calling it as a pigment, can I say that this is something which will impart a color? Okay, so if it is a pigment, it is giving a color. There are two pigments formed. The first one being bilirubin, which is giving a yellow color. The second one called biliverdin, which is going to give a green color. Okay, so over here, what we just did, we just spoke about the fate of the RBC or rather we spoke about the fate of the hemoglobin. Okay, so what happens every day? We know that what is the uh, lifespan of RBC? Lifespan of RBC is how many days? 120 days. After 120 days, what happens? It goes to the spleen. In the spleen, it's dead. That's why spleen is called as graveyard. Then what happens? After that goes, after it is dead, then it is going to be uh, broken down in the spleen. There, the protein part sent to the plasma. The remaining part, heme part, taken to the liver. In the liver, the iron part is taken out and stored in the form of ferritin. Now, whatever is left is going to be converted to bile pigments. Which are those bile pigments? They are bilirubin and they are biliverdin. Yellow color and green color. In fact, these are the pigments which are giving the color to your stools. Without these pigments, the stools would be whitish in color, indicating that there is some problem in the liver. Okay, so this what we just did was about the hemoglobin breakdown. Now, sometimes if you, uh, if we consider some sort of deformity in the shape of the RBC, okay, it's supposed to be biconcave shape, okay, circular. But if at all, sometimes some of the RBCs may start, there must be a genetic disorder where the RBCs start developing a sickle kind of shape like you can see over here, okay. If that RBC develops a sickle kind of shape, what would happen? All the defense systems of your body, our WBCs who are our fighters would actually be seeing this as a foreign substance and what would they do? They would attack these. So these would be destroyed. So what is being destroyed? RBCs are being destroyed. Also, can you see that this shape is not going to permit a lot of hemoglobin. So less oxygen and this is what we call as a condition called as sickle cell anemia. So this sickle cell anemia is a condition where or is a genetic disorder where the RBCs develop a sickle type of shape which is going to be eventually those cells would be destroyed and the person would be suffering from less RBC and less hemoglobin levels. Alright, so now in our next lecture we are going to be beginning with the defense system of our body that is leukocytes okay but before we begin with leukocytes let's just have a quick recap of what all we covered in today's lecture well today's lecture started off with bone right after bone we did the uh, we did all the uh, different functions of bone we did the different parts of bone right after that we also continued with blood in blood, we saw the different components of blood. We saw that there was a liquid part of blood. We saw there was a solid part of blood too. What was the liquid part of blood called as? It was known as plasma. Solid part was called as the blood cells, which contain RBC, WBC and platelets. Tell me which one had more percentage, liquid or solid? Yes, it was liquid which has more percentage, 55%. And solid part had how much? It had 45%. Okay. Then we saw that in the liquid part, there were plasma proteins. Do you remember which they were? The plasma proteins. I think now, by now you should remember it. It was HAFPG, okay, heparin, albumin, fibrinogen, prothrombin and globulin, right? Then we came to the other different components in plasma. There were different components like nutrients nitrogenous waste, then gases were there, regulatory substances were there, all of those things were there too. Alright, after that, uh, we after plasma, we also saw that if plasma is allowed to settle for a little while, we saw that there was a clot forming over there <clears throat> and that clot forming, if the clot is removed, what is remaining behind is what we call as serum. So that was serum over there, alright. Then what else did we see? We also saw uh, the red blood cells, we introduced the red blood cells. Remember in the red blood cells, first formation, where did it happen? Red blood cells, an alternate name, it was called as erythrocyte. Formation occurred in the red bone marrow. 
what was the formation called as does anyone remember that please write it down if you remember it it was called as erythro anyone remember the next word it was called as erythropoiesis so erythropoiesis was the formation of rbcs okay then what was the lifespan of rbcs do you remember that it was how many days 120 days how many months 4 months okay then tell me what about the nucleus does an rbc have a nucleus no it doesn't did an rbc have a nucleus yes it did when when it was developing in the red bone marrow all right then we also saw that rbc had an important component to it which we called as hemoglobin what was hemoglobin made up of it was made up of an iron part that is heme and a globin part or a protein part that is globulin there were four irons four protein four heme four protein chains which were those chains if you remember there were two alpha chains two beta chains the heme part each how many hemes were there there were four hemes and each heme could carry one molecule of oxygen so one whole hemoglobin was carrying four molecules of oxygen all right so we saw all that we also uh, went ahead and we discussed the breakdown of the hemoglobin okay now with today's lecture we're completing here we're gonna stop here at the rbc's in our next lecture that is on monday okay do join me on monday we we'll continue with this blood chapter and we're gonna be studying about wbc's and the platelets too all right so until next lecture do solve today's dpp all right the dpp questions also i'll be revising them i'll be discussing them in our next lecture so that uh, if at all you don't you didn't get any of them right you'd know the answer and also i'd like you to know that if at all you are going through this textbook if you're reading through your textbook or reading through or going through these videos and if you come across any doubt please do uh, post your doubt on our ask a doubt section which is there on the yup master app so do come to there i personally i'm taking care of all the doubts over there some of you have come up with very good doubts and i've answered them so please continue to come along with your doubts okay this would make it fun this would make it interactive too all right so until then until our next lecture on monday uh, stay home stay safe and take care bye